This is Nick Mason, the Living Dead drummer, and you're listening to the Brutally Delicious Podcast. Brutally Delicious! I know you uh, work on quite a lot of stuff. What are you guys? What are you up to right now? Um, actually, today uh, I got two different cool things today. Um, uh, so. Um, one of the bands that I work with, uh, the Rhythm Coffin, which is described as a monster rock and roll band. Um, they're kind of Kiss meets the B-52s meets the Ramones meets Scooby-Doo. Um, really? <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> it's quite it, interesting. It, it is. I mean, it's, there's no other real way to describe it. it. It's it's old school rock and roll. It's very very Ramones kind of stripped down progressions and stuff like that. But it's got the same kind of dynamics as like um, the B fifty twos do, where it's like you know two female singers and a male singer, right. um, uh, and then you know, and then everybody's in costumes and makeup and there's a whole theatrical production going on stage like kiss you know what i mean so uh, it's the only way i could figure it out and then the scooby-doo element comes in because it's we're every song is about like werewolves and zombies and and monsters um yeah so today it's friday the 13th and we just dropped a single um it it hit every major streaming platform uh, at midnight and it's a cover of the monster mash and nice. uh, it features yeah it's we we close out every show playing the monster mash it's like we it's the only cover song we've ever done um the band's been around for like 15 years and at least for the last 10 this is the closer every night no matter what they end the show playing monster mash and they play it very true to the original version it's not super up tempo like all the rest of the songs are um And so we decided to actually just license it for our new record. And we did two versions. One version is just the band playing it the way we normally play it live. And then we did a second version that features guest vocals from Davey Suicide and Calico Cooper from uh, Bisto Blanco. And so that version with the guest vocals just dropped at midnight. And that's available worldwide right now. Nice. nice. Where, can, where can people find um, it? Uh, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, Google Play, uh, SoundCloud, um, pretty much anywhere you get your music from. You know, Target. I don't know. Like <laughs> every, it's the laundry list of of platforms it's on is like three pages long. Um, cool. But if you just look up the Rhythm Coffin. <laughs> And the Monster Mash, it, it should pop right up. I'm gonna check um, that out right away. <laughs> yeah, so that so that just came out today, which is awesome. We've been we sat on it for such a long time. Like the idea came about, you know, eight months ago. We were like, let's just let's just license the song and cover it for the new record. Like, why not? And then it was all what the like, hell. What if we called some favors in on this one too? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. So it's the it's the first single on the new EP, which it, it's a six song EP that that will come out um, October first, and that's called Monster on My Back, and it's got um, a few new original songs on there, um, and then both versions of the monster mash kind of bookending it. The special guest version, uh, opens the CD and then the, our version of it, the, uh, the regular version will close it out. And then stacked in the middle is, you know, a bunch of brand new songs. Nice. Nice. Um, Do you find it difficult playing in, in a theatrical setting like that, you know, with all the costumes and props and things? No, you know what? I love it. I, I, it's, I kind of miss all of that in rock and roll. Like when I, I teach my students this all the time is that people don't go to a concert to listen to music. They just don't. They go to watch a show. People listen with their eyeballs. If 
they're not going to watch a show, then they're going to stay at home with iTunes or, or well, not iTunes anymore, but Spotify, whatever, whatever the most updated thing is. I've been saying that so long, it literally went home from stay at home with radio to, you know, progressing oh, through right. the decades <laughs> of like, stay at home with, you know, with your Zoom. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, Man, uh, my, my, uh, but, my iPad's so old, it sounds analog. <laughs> right, exactly. But the the point is the same, is that people go out to watch a show, and if you're not entertaining them and giving them something to watch, you're failing at your job, and you don't deserve to be on stage. So I'm I'm all about it. Bring the makeup, bring the lights, bring the, the you know, with the Rhythm Coffin, we have um, different, we have a crew that comes out and actually comes on stage and does different routines while we play kind of like an Alice Cooper show. Uh, you know, we have, we have fire, we have confetti cannons. We have a song called the headless head bop where we literally are throwing styrofoam heads into nice. the audience <laughs> and encouraging people to throw them around. And it looks dude from the stage. It looks like you're looking at a popcorn maker out in the crowd because That's it's awesome. just, decorated styrofoam heads bouncing around. We, we tell people throw them at us. Um, we, we have a song called gruesome's cockroach coffee. And it's like this super fast, like two minute play as fast as you fucking can song. And we have two giant, like six foot inflatable cockroaches that get (laughs) tossed into the audience (laughs) Nice, and they go crowd surfing. You know what I mean? And then, you know, of course we have, we have our guests coming on, you know, we have a song called famous monster and w- one of our guys comes out in like a suit and top hat and a creature from the black lagoon mask. And he does the whole kind of like prancing around the stage with the top and tails kind of thing, you know? And, um, it's awesome. I mean, bring it the, the more, the merrier. I, I can't get enough of that stuff. I love it. Oh, that's that's awesome. awesome. And then, you know, I grew up on Kiss and Alice Cooper and that whole theatrical sort of thing. I'm dating myself, but I really do appreciate the, you know, the full package rather than, you know, just some dude staring at his feet and playing the guitar. Yeah. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I, you know, when I kind of matured and came into my own was the early 90s, you know, so the stripped down thing, Nirvana, the grunge movement. That was what sucked me into music in the first place. Yeah. But, and I, and I love it. I, I'm, I have a very, very passionate, you know, opinion that the nineties were the best decade for music top to bottom. <coughs> but, Sorry. But you got, I like nothing's going to beat a, an Alice Cooper show or a kiss show or a Rob right. zombie show or anything like that. Like you're not going to beat it. You're absolutely not. You know, one of the greatest live shows I've ever seen in my life was Rammstein. And it was just because oh they literally God. lit everything on fire for an hour and a half and then right. peaced out and just left the audience stunned of like, what just happened to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, man. Yeah, I like that. I agree. Like, Oh, um, yeah. I, I grew up in like, I am i don't know, I'm 43 now, but I grew up in the 90s like you did. And I agree, like, such an amazing thing. But I remember in the 80s, like, when I was in junior high or whatever, I was mm-hmm. going to see Motley Crue, Girls, 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 you know? And Tommy Lee is coming out over the audience in this spinning drum set, and there's fire everywhere. And it was just mesmerizing to see something. Yeah, man. Like I mean, drum solos suck, unless you're doing something like that. Yeah, You exactly. know what I mean? And I'm a drummer, and I'm telling you, like, I think drum <laughs> solos are boring. I think they suck. I see someone doing a drum solo, I'm like, I'm going to go get a beer. Yeah. But <laughs> if you're Tommy Lee and you're swinging from the rafters or, or you're doing something that is, is a little more inclusive, like when Godsmack does it and Sully rolls out on a drum kit and they do a drum That's battle. That's really cool. But, you know what I mean? And what people don't realize is that the guitar player and the bass player just step off to the side during that solo but they continue to play. So it's not really a drum solo because there's still rhythm going on. There's still guitar and bass going on underneath it. Just, you know, the spectacle of having two drummers go head to head overshadows it with your eyeballs. So again, it's giving you something to, to latch on to visually. So uh, unless you're going to step up your game and do something really badass like that, drum solos suck. 
you know? <laughs> I, like, I also like what Metallica did on the last tour where they came out with the big uh, Tyco drums and they just... Oh, all... I didn't see that. Oh, you I gotta didn't get check to see it out. Metallica the last round. Uh, yeah, when they came to LA, I was on... everybody I knew in the world was at the show <laughs> except me. I did see them um, when they played Jimmy Kimmel. Oh, yeah. um, I, I got to see that and I very quickly realized that I am too old to be in the front row at a Metallica concert. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, because <laughs> like, Oh yeah, it was cool until they started playing. And then I was like, Oh my God, what the hell? Um, <laughs> I'm going to get injured that was here. When I, it was, I mean, I'm like pinned against the guardrail trying to protect some old lady from, you know, right. 12 dudes who are just slam dancing behind us. And I'm like, Oh oh shit i'm i this was this was cool when i was 23 but right now i'm like fearing for my safety (laughs) it's amazing how that all changes right oh oh yeah it was you know and i was so pumped for it too because every time i've seen metallica i've been fortunate enough to be like you're right in the pit in the front row and i was like yeah this is gonna be great and and it's smaller it's private they're going to play you know two songs to tape on tv and then they're going to play for another 30 minutes of their greatest hits it's going to be it's going to be sweet and i was like it was sweet until he started playing and then i was more on like <laughs> right then i felt more like i was trying to be a bouncer and then i was enjoying the concert <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah i know if you can go oh, on youtube man. and you can check it out but they had these these huge taiko drums that they roll out on stage but they had like mm-hmm. they had electronic pads in them, and the whole band gets in on this drum solo. So they, oh, that's cool. Yeah, it was really really cool. So I don't know. All right. Yeah, check it out. It's pretty cool. I I really need to, I need to check that out immediately. I'm going to watch that this morning while I'm eating breakfast. I'm going to look that up. That's so cool. Nice. Yeah. Now I have another question for you here. I'm just looking at at, sure. your, fa- at your Facebook under your biography, and I, mm-hmm. there's so many credits to your name, but there's a few that stick out to me tough how did you end up with that band (laughs) uh i love those guys they're awesome um so i uh they're one of their longtime drummers was a longtime friend of mine okay and and he called me up and and just needed a sub for a couple of shows kind of thing they were doing a handful of dates over the course of a week on the west coast and he had a conflict because he was i think he was teching for Def Leppard at the time. Ah. So he was on the he was on the road as Def Leppard's drum tech and couldn't do these couple of shows that they were going to do. So he called me up and asked if I wanted a sub for it. Uh and so I did it that way. So I just subbed for a few dates and then um I had a scheduling conflict so I only committed to like the first half of the dates but after we did those dates, they called me back up and were like, you want to do a couple more? <laughs> and then um, they, you know, and then we kind of stayed in touch after that. And they called me back up again, you know, a little while later, like, hey, we're doing some stuff on the East Coast. Do you want to fly out? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it became one of those things where just every so often they'll call up and say, hey, we're doing like you know, a weekend of stuff in this area, or we're doing four or five shows spread out over a week right. over here. And they, they'll just call up every once in a while and, and, uh, throw a couple things at me. Like, so what's your calendar looking like right now? You know, nice. <laughs> um, I didn't even know they were still playing. That's why I asked. I, you know, I haven't seen, th- I haven't talked to them in a little while, little while, and I don't know how active they are at the moment. But yeah, for for the last bunch of years, like they'd go out maybe once a year and just do a couple of weekends doing some some festivals or, you know, headlining some some larger or you know small clubs, kind of like middle sized club kind of things. They'll go out and do a handful of dates. And then cap it off with a festival or something like that. Like, yeah. we, you know, when I played with them, we did a couple of radio show um, dates in Southern California and then a crew fest thing. And then oh, nice. we did the same thing on the East Coast where it was like, oh, we played a couple of decent sized clubs headlining. And then 
played, you know, third to last at a two day eighties hair metal festival in, in Wisconsin or something like that, you know? Yeah. Right. Um, but they're, those guys are super, super cool. Um, you know, a lot of the time with, with bands, I've found that like either had already kind of plateaued or had their success or, or achieve some level of success for a long period of time, they can kind of get egotistical and stuff like that. And the guys in tough are not that at all. Like they're, they're going into this just, you know, counting their blessings that people still want to buy a ticket to come see them. That's right. And they're really humble and they, they know where they're at in their career and there's no misconception about it. And they, they're fun. They joke about it. Like they, they know what's up. You know, yeah, yeah, and you know it's cool because they would joke around on stage when we would play some of their older material. They're like, "Nick was in kindergarten when this song hit MTV," <laughs> and one night, <laughs> you know. And the thing is, one time I did the math on it, and I was like, "Yeah, sure, I was in kindergarten when this song hit That's MTV." That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> now the other artist yeah. that I see here is Shania Twain. So yeah, of that one all, got me. Of all the three things, all like. You're talking about the first band, which is like, you know, totally theatrical and doing the monster mash. Then you go to '80s hair metal, and now you have Shania. How how yeah. how did that even happen? Like, is, that, there's nobody bigger than Shania besides Garth Brooks. So, like, how did you get right. on that gig? Um, the that one was was a long, long time ago. And um, what happened was it was like her first big tour. Before, or I mean, her last big tour before she kind of took a hiatus for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, what she she had a section in her show built in that um, required extra percussion, ah. you know. And rather than hire a handful of guys to come out on the road to come do just one part of the show. Yeah. And have it be really expensive and cost worthy and, you know, renting extra bunks on the bus just so a couple guys can come out on stage for 10 minutes a night. Yeah. Um, she decided to just farm local talent in every stop along the, the tour. Oh, that's awesome. And so I got a call uh, saying Shania is looking for drummers and she's coming to town in two days or something like that. And and I got put in touch with her record label and then they set it up. So, nice. um, you know, they kind of did like a, a quick audition where they, they took like 20 guys and, you know, we had to, we had to learn the material real quick. And then the band kind of came in and just cherry picked and went, I want you, I want you and I want you and the rest of you guys go home. And then the next thing you do is you're on stage, you know, doing sound check in an arena. <laughs> um, wow. yeah so it was cool so i ended up doing that which was kind of badass and it was cool and it was uh you know i was young and it was my first time stepping on the stage in front of twenty thousand people oh, which yeah. was outstanding and then she went on to win i think at the cma she won like best live you know show of the year or something like that and the cool thing is during all of the concert footage they showed of her when she was nominated, it was all footage from the show I did with her. Oh, that's <laughs> that's beautiful. Cool. Yeah, it was great. Um, and so that's where that kind of came in. I mean, it was a quick thing. It's not like I was on the road with her for a long time or anything like that. It was, um, it was like one section of one part of the tour, but it was, it was still cool. And it was still a really great experience of getting my feet wet in arena production Sure. Which then kind of helps later in the career when I would get to, to do that a few more times, you know? Oh, absolutely. Also yeah, very also cool that you could do some other kind of music that it cross over. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I like variety, you know? Um, I get asked a lot by people like, wouldn't you like to just be in one band and have just one band? And I'm like, no. I <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I like going and doing something different all the time. Actually, the last gig I did was a country gig. Um, a week ago, a, a friend of mine called me and asked me to sub for him on a country gig. It was like the most ridiculous 
situation ever. Um, less than 24 hours notice and doing four sets of country songs, like 60 something songs. Right. With, with no prep time at all. And I told him, I'm like, I don't have time to even like make a playlist to listen to these songs, much less learn them before five o'clock tomorrow. So if your band is cool with me, just kind of showing up and winging it, then yeah, I'll do the gig. And that's exactly what I did. And that's, that's what I did. And there was like, out of these 60 some songs, they gave me the set list. Now I'm like, yeah, i heard of five of these (laughs) and the rest of them i don't i have no idea what they are i don't know how they sound i don't nothing so you know luckily i had a good bass player and and just he was able to kind of hold my hand through all the songs and give me all the changes and the stops and and where the tempos were and stuff like that and then i and i step out and i did you know an entire night of country and that was last week, and now tonight I'm doing a vaudeville themed show, <laughs> wow. playing you know again really theatrical stuff where I'm going to be in makeup and we're going to have burlesque dancers on stage and you know and um, yeah it's like you know and then the next one's going to be something different and then the next one's something different and it's uh, I like it that way you know what I mean I like That's being able cool. to play play metal on Thursday and then play the blues on Friday. It's, it's great. That's That's awesome. Okay. Now, Oh, go ahead. Yo, go ahead. I have a really, (laughs) I have a really geeky question. So I own a software company that makes drum virtual instruments. What, Mm -hmm. what is your favorite snare drum? Um, my favorite snare drum, you know, it's kind of a, kind of a coin toss so uh, there's like the coveted holy grail of of snares and that's um like the tama bell brass from the 80s that's a beautiful drum everybody makes a version of it nowadays and stuff like that which is cool But, but that was the snare drum that was heard on every major rock record when i was growing up it was, and it's instantly identifiable. It's the snare drum on all of '90s Metallica stuff, the Black Album, Load, Reload. Like yeah. it's the snare drum that Dave Grohl used on Nevermind. It's yeah. it was used like every big rock record in the '90s. That was the snare drum that the producer would roll out. Yeah, well, that and, was it. Was backline. They would just rent it. <laughs> yeah, and they they and yeah, he, I had a fly date out here in LA before I lived here one time. Yeah. And I went to the same backline company, um, to get my gear and they had three of them. Oh my and God. You just know, you just knew one of those was used on all these records. And I was like, <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> and Put it that weighs one in the a case ton. And taking that one. You know what I mean? Um, how, how heavy was it? It, Oh, it weighs like 15 pounds. It's ridiculous. You know, <laughs> awesome. um, it's so good though. You can put any head on it. You can tune it any way you want, no matter what, it's going to sound great. Yeah. And especially in a studio, you can do so much with it and tweak it so many ways to make it sound like a thousand different things. So that's probably one of my favorite snares. And, and then opposite that is like, you know, the, the black beauty snare yeah the ludwig black beauty which is you know a much thinner version of the bell brass so the bell brass is three millimeters thick and a and it's bronze and then you know a black beauty is one millimeter thick brass that is coated in in black chrome and that's another one that i have two versions of that snare neither one's an actual ludwig one but they're i have a yamaha one that they custom made me nice. and it's cool because it's flat black and it's the only one in existence and then i have mm-hmm. another one that's got the black chrome on it that that i got and um that's another one that can just do anything i use it probably about 90 percent of the time on every recording and every live show i do because no matter what head i put on it or how i tune it I'm going to get the sound I want. If I need a big, deep, fat country sound, yeah. I'm going to put a thick head on it and drop tune it. If I need to play, 
you know, a funk tune, I'll crank the head and put something thinner on it and it'll do that. And then I'll sound like the chili peppers or, uh, you know what I mean? Like yeah, it can versatile. do anything, no matter what it can do anything. And, um, uh, so I use that more than anything else ever. And that's why I own two of them is because, you know, I'm, I'll bring two of them out on a gig. So if one goes down mid show, my backup sounds exactly the same. <laughs> right. <you know>? Awesome. <laughs> that's pretty perfect. Okay. Now yeah. this is my last time. I'm such a tech geek. Sometimes I drive no, crazy I am this too. way. I really, I'm super nerdy and super geeky and I, I absolutely love talking about gear and stuff like that. Um, it, you know, however, unless your listeners are drummers, they're going to be like, dude, who the fuck is <laughs> the snare drum? But, you know. No, it, it's, so, it's, it, shoot. it, it just me. I always ask drummers these questions because I, I want to know. Cool. And, um, yeah. How do you feel about electronic kits now and, and, and virtual instruments and how they're kind of transforming the way people are, are tracking music these days, especially drums? Um, I got a love hate with it. So, you know, electronic drum kits have come a long way and the, the top tier ones that you can get right now, um, are really, really fantastic. And, and you can do a lot with them and, and I absolutely see their benefit. And I've done a, a bunch of records where pre-production was all done on like, an expensive electronic kit and we just MIDI sampled, you know, uh, some software that has actual audio samples of drums that I wanted to use. Yeah. And it, it sounds good. It sounds really, really good. But yes. at the end of the day, nothing's going to be the sound of an actual mic'd drum. And so that's always my preference. Now with, with being a, a session drummer, and playing live more than in the studio, I am always learning songs for somebody else. Everyone's always sending me their songs and I'm just learning whatever it was that they already produced. Yeah. I'd say 75% of the time, there's no drummer on those songs and it's all programmed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you get a really good producer and he, and they really know how to do this stuff, the programming sounds fantastic to the point where you, you almost can't even tell that it's not a drummer, but there's not everybody in the world is that precise with it. I and <laughs> I don't care what you say. A guitar player is not going to know how to properly program drums to make them feel and sound like a drummer played it no, no I, matter right. what. I, I have a theory and, and I even started a blog yeah. about it called think like a drummer. So like, cause I was sick and tired of getting mixes from bands that were programmed by guitar players or singers. Yeah. You know, they just sound yeah. so like it, there's no pattern to anything. There's no rudiments. There's nothing. <laughs> it's well, just, a lot of the time what I've found, and this has become really very, very trendy in, in modern rock music, the last handful of years is they start changing up the kick pattern too often. And it almost never recycles back to just a groove. Yeah. It's like, Oh no, like it's going to play this for a bar and a half and then it's going to add this note, but then it's going to take it away there. And then it's going to add two more notes there. And then like your kick patterns all over the place and it's because you got, you know, a guitar player or a singer or somebody thinking that they're being creative. And it's like, no, if you just put make a pattern out of it yeah. that recycles every bar or every two bars, and then you spread that out over eight to 16 bars, oh my God, there's your kick pattern. And it doesn't have to progress and chop up and be something completely different on bar 16 than it was on bar one. Oh, yeah. It's you're destroying the actual groove by trying to be creative because you're you're not really being creative you're just making something different for the sake of making it different absolutely and and the other thing people don't realize is that drummers have two arms and that's it <laughs> two unless you're Def Leppard <laughs> then you only get one right <laughs> generally speaking two and you can't program things that require three or four arms and that happens a like lot 
snare and, floor tom two cymbals and a hi-hat at the same time you don't like that yeah exactly <laughs> and it happens all the time because they're like they want to beef up the sound and then i'm like yeah it sounds cool but you can't duplicate that live oh no, no. what's and, that gonna look like <laughs> yeah and i'm of the mo- i'm of the opinion that anything you put down you know in the studio needs to be duplicated live you want your listeners to watch the show hearing what they remember not hearing your interpretation of what they remember right. like that's doing a disservice to your audience is you know is doing something different on stage than what you threw down in the stu- in the studio and what they're hearing on the radio like I don't want to go see a band and have them play some weird artistic version or a bastardized version because they can't actually pull it off. Oh yeah. When exactly. they're on stage, you know what I mean? Um, where you can get away with that sort of thing, I think is with specific genres of music. Um, when it comes to, you know, electronic music, obviously it's in the name, it's electronic um, in other aspects too. Um, industrial bands and stuff like that. I, you know, I'm going to go to a nine inch nails show or something like that, or, or band that's even more extreme, like KMFDM. I'm going to go see them live knowing full well that that shit on the record wasn't real. It was programmed, but they are still going to duplicate it live through the use of, you know, backing tracks and, and MIDI and yeah, samples and, and triggers and all kinds of stuff like that. But that's the nature of that kind of music. So I feel like you get a pass with that sort of thing. But if you're, you know, playing in a regular rock band or a country band or, or whatever, um, I, I really am a fan of like a drummer went into the studio and actually hit a drum to produce the sound that I'm right. hearing uh, on Spotify. Oh, you know? I, I agree with you. I own a drum software company. I make virtual instrument drum software, but as an engineer, I always prefer a live drummer. I, yeah. It, there's yeah, just absolutely. something, there's just something about that feel. And, you know, you could try to recreate that and you can get pretty damn close with software, you know, but yeah, you also lose the drummer because you know, I always, I always like to use this as an example. You could put four drummers in the same room and have them have like run a blind test and tell each of them to play four on the floor. And, and then you're going to have to choose which one played it the best. And let's just say they're all the best drummers in the world. They're all going to have a different four on the floor, every single one of them, even though it's the same beat. Absolutely. Absolutely. You like, there is nothing um incorrect about what you just said that that's i i 100% agree and and when you decide which one played it the best too that's subjective that's a Absolutely. matter of your personal opinion cuz you could also stick four guys behind the board and be like no i liked a and the other guys could be like no i like guy b you know what i mean sure absolutely and, and that's the thing too is there's this striving for perfection thing i i think really with at the end of the day why so many people are using programmed drums and stuff is a it's easy anyone can do it um and b it's this this striving for perfection that everyone has everyone wants things a specific way it's a control issue they want control over the finished product and by putting someone behind the driver's seat that's not you is relinquishing that control on a subliminal level Mm -hmm. and it's very difficult for people who are producing this music or any music to give up that control because they want it their way and if you hit the snare drum in a way that doesn't sound like what you have it in your head as yeah then you're gonna get axed from the gig and they're gonna program it and it's it's stupid. It's absolutely <laughs> stupid. I think it's more affordable it's, too, you know, for a lot of people. Where we are. Well, yeah, that's the other thing too, is you don't gotta pay a guy to come in and do it and then have that person do it a way that doesn't line up with the fictional version you have floating around in your head. 
you know and, and the studio time so, and the engineer and and you know it's all like, yeah you know like i don't know what studio rates are like in in la but here in dc i can get a decent studio for about a thousand us for for a day and then i have to pay if i was a musician i'd have to pay the engineer so that's going to be what another three to five hundred bucks for the day and then you know then you have the musician that you have to pay and however many songs they're going to do and and how how, ma- how much right. they're going to charge per song by the end of the day you know maybe you're going to do five songs you might be looking at you know four or five thousand dollars for that day right yeah exactly and that's the other thing too is that no one has the budgets that they used to have a lot of people now are just self financing too absolutely um, it's the majority sad. of the work that i do is all like a dude scraping by at a day gig to then hire me to play his songs, you know? Yeah. And so the budgets aren't what they used to time is money. And, um, it's funny. I was listening to one of your, your guys podcasts just yesterday. Um, and you had a band on from, from overseas and they were talking about their new record and how they actually, you know, spent like a month in the studio kind of doing it old school. Oh yeah. And, and I was like, man, Nobody gets to do that anymore. Like nowadays yeah. when I'm hired to come in on a session, they want to layer as many songs on they on me as they can in a six hour block and try to have me crank out, you know, five, six, seven, sometimes 10 songs in one day. Yeah. And they want me to do it in, in seven or eight hours. And I'm like, that's not realistic. Like, it's right. insane. Are you kidding me? I said that you to know? those guys. I remember saying that to them. What? You yeah. spent that long in the studio? How the hell did you do no that? No one gets to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no one no one ever gets to do that at all anymore. The the rhythm coffin, the the record that we have coming out with the monster mash on and everything, we did drums, guitar, bass, vocals on five and not just one vocal, like everybody in the band sings. So five people doing vocal tracks, myself included. We did five songs in one 12-hour day. Yeah, and then went back a second day to mix. Went back a th- third day to add the guest vocals with Calico and Davey, and then, um, and then I went back by myself with the engineer on a fourth day to mix just that song with their vocals, and um, so a total of four days in the studio, and and you know. The, the mixing days were only kind of half days, but you know, we cranked out a, a top to bottom six song record in four days, realistically, wow. which is stupid. It should have oh, taken yeah, us four absolutely. months, not four days. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But that's how everybody wants it now. And that's the other thing too, is it, it puts so much pressure on the players and on the musicians. So when you do have a drummer coming in and you do have a, a guitar player and a bass player coming in, and you're not just doing it by yourself or programming it. That's a lot of pressure you're putting on somebody, um, expecting them to just crank all of these songs out, take after take after take after take. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's gotten to a point where I'll, I'll tell people, I'm like, look, you got three takes. I'll run the song top to bottom three times you pull what you need from those three takes. I'm not doing any more than that because it's going to waste time or we're not going to get to the next song. Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, if I can't nail it in three takes, then I'm not doing my job right. So right. <laughs> um, there you go. <laughs> but it would be nice to be you able to like the drum on the song dreams. and be a little more creative. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah. that's awesome, Bruce. Um, yeah. If, uh, uh, do you have any more technical questions, Chris? Are you, we, no, uh, sorry. I just, I geek out. No, when that's I fine. To drummers, man. I just, you know, that's, I know we do this a lot, but so I just like to, uh, ask some questions at the end, just for, uh, get fans a chance to get to know you a little bit better. But if you were stranded yeah. on a deserted Island and could take three records, say for the rest of your life, assuming you had like a solar powered player of some sort, what would they be? Um, uh, this was, that's, uh, damn it. This is one of the, I hate desert island questions because <laughs> I'm like I don't know I don't All right. know what I would we could skip that, that then could... what was the first record um, you no, bought no I'll with give you own... an answer okay yeah, I'll, I'll give you an answer it's okay All right. it's like I gotta I gotta like think you said three records three that I had to live sure. with for the rest of my life yeah okay 
Um, uh, I'm going to say Aerosmith's first record. They're self-titled. Mm-hmm. Um, the Black Album from Metallica. Nice. Um, yeah. And the third one, man, I... I I don't know if I'd have an actual specific album, but I probably would take something from like ZZ Top. Oh, cool. Um, nice. You know what I mean? I, I feel like I, that's a good balance. The Metallica can, can get some energy out when I need it. Um, Aerosmith's my favorite record. Or, or it's my favorite band of all time. I don't know my favorite record, but my favorite band of all time. And their first record just, you know, is perfect front to back. And, and it and set really, the tone for the rest of their career. Yeah, and and absolutely it did. And then I've always been a fan of ZZ Top because they, they made blues cool in an era when blues was very underground kind of thing. And, you know, they were they were big in the 80s with all the hair metal, but they weren't doing yeah. hair metal. They were doing Sharp Dressed Man. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they made the blues fun in that era and i love the i absolutely love the blues um and and all all decades of it kind of thing but they were like the fun blues band you know what i mean so Mm -hmm. um i think that would be good to cleanse the palate every once in a while when when i've had too much metallica (laughs) (laughs) there you go well that's all i've got man i appreciate you taking the time Chris, you got anything else? No, I really appreciate it, man. Thank you. I, I, I'm a geek, and I love talking about. No, that stuff turned like that nice. Yeah. <laughs>